Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to help support the show by becoming a premium member, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash podcast to sign up. Memberships are only $2.99 a month. By becoming a premium member, you'll be able to download episodes onto your mobile device and listen to them commercial-free wherever you go. Also, if you'd like to check out the new Dogman Encounters t-shirt store, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash store and take a look around. Buying a t-shirt or sweatshirt there is another great way to help support the show. As always, thanks for listening. Alright, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Valerie Grogan. Valerie, welcome to the show. Hi, Vic. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Valerie, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay. I'm a graphic designer by trade. I've done graphic artwork by commission and with companies throughout my 20s and 30s. And I've been sick recently due to surgery, cancer, and made me become bedfast, basically. And so I've been living in my mother's house for the past few years, and she's been helping me get better. And thankfully, I'm up and about now and ready to move on. I'm just hoping to get on with my work and with my life and continue. Well, I'm hoping you are sooner rather than later. For the longest time, you thought you were the only person who had an encounter with a dog man. How do you find out that wasn't the case? I found out through your show, actually. We've always been intrigued by werewolves, and we did not know why, but my family has always been intrigued by those things. And so my mom actually found your show while I was in the hospital and told me to listen to it with her. The show we listened to first, the man described the dog man as what I had described to her, and so we both kind of became intrigued. And we were like, we must listen to this show because this is like nothing we've ever heard before in the media or in any kind of circumstance. You know, we were used to the dogmen like Teen Wolf and it was just silly werewolf stuff that I grew up with. And so I think the howling was the scariest thing, but we didn't know that these things were actually acknowledged what I had seen until we heard your show. So that's what happened. I heard your show and I was confirmed. It was like, yes, thank you. It was definitely an affirmative thing. It was like, these exist. And they were described the way that I had remembered them. So it was really a relief, actually, because I had been through a lot (laughs) with this whole encounter thing. So it was a relief to know that there were others that had encountered them as well. Yeah, you definitely have been through a lot. And I'm so glad the show's actually helped you. You grew up a Jehovah's Witness. Do you think that had any effect on how you dealt with the experiences you had with dogmen when you were a kid? It did, in the fact that these things weren't supposed to exist. We weren't supposed to believe in them. And my mom had just broken away from that. She had written her letter of resignation from the church due to her own experiences with supernatural things. And... Basically, it had a lot to do with it. You weren't supposed to acknowledge those things. It was all demon, 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 just pounded into your head. And you were demon-possessed if you saw anything like that. So it did have a lot to do with coming out and actually accepting what had happened. You know, I don't think I've ever spoken with a Jehovah's Witness who had an encounter. I wondered how it would have affected you and your ability to deal with the experiences that we're going to talk about tonight. That's interesting. It is interesting, yeah, because they don't accept it. They don't accept any other encounters except what they teach. And so going beyond what they teach was out of the ordinary, and it meant that you yourself were possessed by a demon. And so, you know, we didn't acknowledge a lot of it for a long time. Well, I'd be lying if I said that I knew much about Jehovah's Witnesses and their beliefs. I really don't, so it's interesting to hear that inside information that you just shared with us. When you hear the term doggy bear, what do you think of? 
Uh, I think of my brother looking at me with wide eyes at the window, turning his head, looking at me like he was completely intrigued. And I went to the window and looked with him, and I pushed his head down because I knew what they were. I knew that I had encountered them. And so these things were very large. They had scruffly hair that bounced. When they bounced, they were kind of bluffing at each other, kind of going at each other back and forth. They were huge, and he would just watch them, and I'd push his head down, and he'd get mad at me, of course, but we were very young, and so we'd kind of just peek over the window, and my mom had named them doggy bears, and she doesn't know why, but that's what they were to us, those things that would bluff at the very end of the wood line by our house. They would kind of go at each other, and their hips were different than any dogs that I had ever seen. And I was very afraid. I was afraid for my brother. I was afraid he would go out there and try to play with them or something. But they were very scary to me. Well, thank goodness he never tried to do that, at least not that we know of. Before you tell us about your experiences, please tell us about the place where they happened, since they all happened in the same area. Okay, so it was at a house that my mom is. It was a duplex, and we were by a large wooded area that led down to train tracks and a power plant. And my friend lived at the very end of the road on a dead end, which cannot be identified now even on Google Maps, but it does have an address, and you just can't find it anywhere. And I don't know why, but... This duplex that went down from my place where we lived to my friend's house, it was down a long wooded area and just a street with the wood line right there and just kind of an incline down into the woods. And then the power plant kind of probably about a mile back. It's just right in the middle of the city. I mean, we're on the brink of Kansas City, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri, so it's kind of on the line, but it is definitely the city. And to experience something like this in the city, you don't hear much about that. Yeah, you normally don't hear about encounters like these in cities, but they actually do come into the city, and there are more encounters that take place there than you'd be comfortable knowing about. All right, Valerie, your encounters with dogmen started when you were six. Please tell us all about them and give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay, I made friends with a girl. And she invited me down to her house, which is at the very end of, it was probably several blocks down at that end street. And it went into her driveway in her house. And all along that street was wood. And we would walk down there to her house after school. And everybody was excited because I didn't have friends. And my mom was really happy that I had made a friend because I was a very shy child. And so, We were walking quite often up and down that road, and at one point, we were walking back up, and we heard something walking with us, and we stopped and listened, both of us, and at the first encounter with it, it happened with both me and my friend. We were suddenly snatched from the street. We could hear this thing walking with us at times. And we heard it stop when we stopped and then walk when we walked. And there was an ominous feeling, a very terrible feeling associated with it. And we both kind of got frightened. And before I knew it, I remember an arm coming out and grabbing her and an arm grabbing me. And it took us out into the woods. I remember seeing bits and pieces of trees, not knowing what was going on. And the next thing I knew, I blacked out. And that's the first encounter. And I don't remember detail until the second encounter, which was just with me, which by that time she was terrified and she wouldn't walk back up the street with us or with me. It wasn't us anymore. It was me. She wouldn't walk back with me because she was too afraid of what was on the wood line. And we had seen it. And I was walking up the street, and I told myself I wasn't going to look at it, and this is the first encounter.
encounter that I can actually remember looking over against, you know, my better judgment and seeing what I saw, which was two amber eyes and uh, a uh, a very frightening, it looked like a grin. It looked like a smile and teeth, a lot of teeth. And I, I, I saw its butt and into its haunches. And it was very tall and very big, whatever it was, but it was hunched over, kind of leaning forward and walking with me because she wouldn't walk with me back up the street, which I hated her for because I knew these things were there. And I was like, don't, don't make me do this, but I did. And, uh, I looked over and it would walk with me. And then when I stopped, it would stop. And there was absolutely no sound. Not one sound at all, not a bird, not a cricket, not anything that you would expect to hear near the woods and that we normally heard near the woods. But I stopped and I would start to dissociate from it because I knew that if I looked at it, it would take me. And I was mortified. One day I was walking up and I started kicking the gravel to try to take my mind off of it and make it feel. I know this just in the mind of a child, but I was about six, and I made it feel like I wasn't paying any attention to it. I was kicking the gravel and talking to myself and just kept walking, and the next thing I knew, I was grabbed, and oh my gosh, it grabbed me, and it started running, and I passed out. And I peed on myself by the time I woke up again. And I was still in the midst of running. And we ended up on a thatch of weeds and grass that had been laid down as if an animal had laid there for some time, you know. It was just laid down. I looked up and I was looking at these two dogmen. (sighs) They were shifting back and forth. And the one that brought me there was nervous, and the other one looked like it was upset with that one, that I was even there. And I thought I was going to die, and that my family would never know where I was. They would never know what happened, and they were just, they were shifting back and forth, kind of, in a very unnatural way, kind of, the tops of their waist were kind of going side to side. While they're, they had very long arms and they were kind of down to the ground and watching, but the other one was moving a lot and looking at the other one like it was angry. And they both had amber eyes. They both had very bright gums from the coloring of their fur, which was pretty flat against their face. It reminded me of a, well, the head reminded me of a Rottweiler, the top of the head. And the face actually reminded me and the coloring of a Doberman pincher but they had extremely long mouths and I always had nightmares about those but they had very long mouths and they were making a noise and I can't quite remember the noise that they were making but it didn't sound normal it sounded grunt grunt kind of and they were just kind of going back and forth on their waistline and one was moving a little bit around that area and the other one was moving towards and it just looked like it didn't agree with the other one that I was even there and I felt like like I told you Vic I felt like when the cat catches a rodent and brings it to you as a present I felt like that kind of a situation only I wasn't dead I was I was still alive and before I knew it I was lifted up and I noticed that I had peed my pants and I was upset that I had peed my pants, but I knew that I had done it because of something horrifying that was taking place. And I wanted to get home. I wanted to get to my mother. And that's all I could think about. And I was so afraid for my brother because we had been watching these doggy bears. And these things were on two legs. And I... (sighs) I call them kangaroo people because that's all I could identify them as from the zoo. But I started running, and the one that had brought me there was kind of 
swinging its arm like in a whooshing way to kind of like if you're trying to scatter something out of your house, you know, you're whooshing it out like like throwing it. It was throwing me towards the street. And I ended up on the street and I ran. I had scratches all over my legs. And I ran home and I told my mom what had happened. And that's what I remember. It just, it whooshed me towards the street. I don't know what they were communicating to each other, but one did not seem happy that I was there. The other one seemed upset that the other one wasn't happy about it. So that's all I can say about that part of it, really. You said the dogman that grabbed you was nervous. Why do you say that? I think it was nervous because the other one was angry. It didn't want me there. And I think that that's why it was nervous. It it had brought me for a reason, and the other one didn't want me there. And so I think that it just, it was nervous because it was like a dog in subjection would roll over on its stomach usually. This thing seemed like it was in subjection to the other one. It seemed like the other one was more prominent than that one in stance and in action and in the way of thinking. And that's a whole other thing, the way of thinking, their communication with me and with with what I think people in general, if they encounter these things, there's like this psychic kind of thing going on. It's weird. Did those two dogmen seem to be both males or did it seem like they were male and female? They both seem to be male. They were definitely male, but I couldn't see any genitalia. I was very young, and I didn't look there to see that. But, yeah, I could tell that they were both alpha male, kind of. There was no female. You said they were huge. How big would you say they were? Well, from the wood line, it went down onto an incline where the incline down, and there were trees growing up towards the top of the hill by the street. And so on the incline, I could see the butt and the haunches, I guess, the knees going forward, kind of like a dog, and then backward. And they were very big. They were big enough. I would say they were as tall as I was at six years old, just the butt going down into the knees. And it was kneeled. It was kind of hunched over. So I would say probably about maybe three to four feet from what I could see of its butt to the first knee indention thing that went forward. And then its back legs went, it, its haunches like went down into the incline. So it was pretty tall and its body was humongous. It was, I would say if it stood up, it would probably be taller than my grandfather. And it was very built. I mean, these things were ripped. They were, they had, Pecs, they had the, the packs on their stomach. I mean, these things were really ripped and they're huge. I mean, abnormally muscular, probably I would say across. If I were laying down at six years old, it would have been equally as long from shoulder to shoulder as I was. Yeah, sounds like they must have been big. When that one dog man was carrying you into the woods, how was he holding you? He held me like, he had me at the waist, and I was kind of just at the waist. It was like you grabbed somebody and you were running with them. And my legs were hanging down and my front was hanging, and I passed out twice. But when I came to, I was still being run with. And so I was kind of bouncing along for the ride on just being held by my waistline. The rest of me was just kind of dangling, I guess, on either side of his arm. So he kind of had you folded over his arm and was holding you up against his body as he ran with you. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. I see. I'm going to ask you to do something, Valerie, that you might not be ready to do yet. And if that's the case, please let me know, because I don't want to interrupt the progress you're making dealing with your encounters. Here's what I'm getting at. I just released a new t-shirt design in the Dogman Encounters store. It's listed as the Rogue Collection design. 
That illustration depicts what a canine type dogman can look like more accurately than any dogman illustration I've seen to date. You need to understand that it's a very intense, realistic depiction of a dogman. Do you think you can handle looking at that? Yes. Alright, if you're sure that won't be too much for you to handle, please go to dogmanencounters.com and click on the link for the store page. Once you have the store page on your screen, please scroll down a little and look for an illustration that's labeled Rogue Collection. Once you've got that up, please let me know. I've done that. Now that you've got that pulled up, how does the dogman in that illustration look compared to the dogman that took you and your friend into the woods that day? The head is shaped the same in the back, and the front is shaped the same, like from the jowls down. The one I saw had a mouth that I guess it was smiling or had its mouth wide open because they were kind of, they had their tongues hanging and they were, their mouths were open. But that's as clear of a depiction as I could say. Their muzzles were a little longer with the fact that I guess it was because their mouths were open into a smile kind of thing. But that's a pretty clear depiction as far as the width of the head along with the jowls on forward. Yes, that's very much close to what I saw. And the two that I saw were, it was like they were smiling or growling or something, but their lips were pulled back to show all of the teeth in their mouth. Yeah, I can only imagine what that must have been like. To be that young and have such a traumatic experience happen, that's horrible. It was. Yeah, I'll bet it was. Why do you think those two dogmen took you and your friend into the woods like that that day? I honestly am not quite sure. One seemed to have a connection. When you look into their eyes, something seems to happen. And I've actually heard other people describe it on your show, and it's pretty accurate. There's some kind of psychic thing where they see through you. And my family were a bunch of empaths anyway, so it's like it grabbed me emotionally. And at first it felt like it was looking for a companion of sorts, but I was a six-year-old child. Between six and seven was or these incidents where it would even follow me to the edge of the wood line. But I would say that its reasoning was mostly to taunt because there was never a good feeling. It was always ominous. It was always very scary. I was frightened. I figured if it took me again, I would never see my family. And I don't think it had any good intentions at all, not in a human way. I think its intentions were were bad. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, when you're six years old, you should be worrying about so many other things besides getting over an experience like that. That is so hard to deal with. Very much so. Especially the emotional connection that it had, that was hard to deal with. Because I could feel them, and I knew when it felt me. I could feel it. It was like, all of a sudden, my stomach would knot up, and I knew to just dissociate and not think about it, not feel it, not let it feel me. It was a very unusual connection. But my friend felt it, too, and... That's why she never walked up the street with me again. You should be worrying more about, like, the kids in the neighborhood than some scary monster that's going to grab you and take you into the woods that nobody believes in, you know. That's right. That's all you should have had to worry about. After you were taken for the first time, did you tell your mom about it right away, or did you wait to do that? No, I told her right away. She was always very open with us. She had just left the Jehovah's Witness organization and so she had taught us to be very open and honest with her and I had told her all about it. She wondered where the marks had come from on my legs and on my arms and it was from running through the woods. So I did, I told her right away. When you told her, how did she respond? (sighs) I remember that it was, okay, so there's an animal in the woods and I don't want you to go playing in the woods anymore. But she had had experiences of her own with things like this. And she acted like it was an animal and to stay away from it. And 
there were doggy bears in the woods and we just needed to be careful. I mean, there was really no, it's not her fault. It's just that she didn't know what it was either. And she didn't know what I had experienced. So her reaction was more like it was an animal in the woods and we're going to start taking you back and forth to your friend's house. So they started driving me down there and up. <sighs> yeah. But not all the time. Sometimes I'd have to walk in. Those walks were very frightening for me because I wanted, I was a kid and naturally I thought, okay, if I get down to her house, I'll be okay until I have to come back up and then I'll worry about it then. But for the most part, I mean, my mom would drive me down there and expect her mom to bring me back up, but her mom did not always do that. So sorry, I'm a little shaken, but that didn't always happen. But when it did happen, I would hear it walking beside me. And I would feel when it felt me and it was frightening. So I didn't, I didn't know how, how to get through it. She knew I had nightmares about dogs with incredibly long mouths and muzzles and she'd have to check under my bed every night and in the closet and every crevice and nook that there was. She'd have to check to make sure that there wasn't anything bad because I was mortified. And there was just absolutely nothing that could ease that from me. And I had nightmares constantly about these things. And I honestly didn't know what it was until I heard your show and I heard people describe it. That's when I knew what I had seen and that it was real. I had talked to psychologists about it, but they told me to put it into place with something traumatic that had happened in my life. But I couldn't place that. That was just something that happened. It was a definite fact. And over the years, it's been a constant reminder. It's always come to my mind because we live in an area where there are woods. And when you go to the park, there are tree lines everywhere and little paths. And so, you know, I've always been afraid. I've always had that in the back of my mind. What did I see? What did I see? And then I heard your show and it wasn't kangaroo people. It was dogmen. So. It was kind of a confirmation to me. It made a lot of sense. I'm real grateful for it. It's one of those things where you think back and you're like, how did a child of that age actually deal with that? But I did. I don't honestly know how, except just dealing with it, just going along with whatever, continuing. But we eventually moved, and so that was a great relief. But... We still saw things that were of that nature, so I don't think you can get away from them, especially once you've seen one or had a connection with one. I think that something stays, and you're always aware of them, and they're always aware of you, and when they come into play in your life, you can definitely feel something's off, and I'm glad that I can definitely now acknowledge what that feeling is, and understand that I'm not the only one who's been through that and I'm not the only one who feels that connection and I'm not the only one who has encountered these things and they keep coming back you know it's not one of those things I can keep going as long as I know I'm not alone you're definitely not alone you just mentioned the fact that your mom has had experiences with them too what'd she tell you about her experiences actually at the house that I'm at now with her because she's been taking good care of me from my surgical issues. At this house, it was my grandparents' house. It was built during World War II and around the whole flood issue that happened. And she would look out the window and she would scream. And nobody knew why. Her siblings thought she was insane, although they've experienced their own things. They always thought she was crazy, and they had to tell her, you know, the monsters were in a dream. But she had a knowledge of upright dogs, dogs standing on two feet walking. And they weren't alone. They were with other creations of sorts, I guess. I mean, I've told you about my faith and where it lies and everything. And so not believing like a Jehovah's Witness, but I do believe in Christ and God Almighty and the Holy Spirit, and I believe in angels and all that. I believe that there are other creations that we don't understand that are as a real. And they seem like what she had seen was as a real. These things could come and go and disappear as they please. But they would come towards her window at night 
and she'd feel it and she'd look out the window and she'd be frightened. But she'd look out the window and she'd see upright dogs just walking toward her, toward her window with other beings. She was about 10 when it started. They moved here and she remembered it starting around then. But I didn't know until I was an adult that it had even taken place. Well, I can understand her not wanting to share that with you, but I do wish she would have shared that with you sooner than she did. Right. But I understand. I mean, I had had such nightmares about these things that she did not want to scare me. She didn't want to put more fear into me. And I was already traumatized. And she didn't want to make that worse. She didn't want to add on to it. So when we could both talk about it later on, it was okay. I could deal with it by then, to an extent. Has your mom seen them recently? About, well, I would say it was in the spring, the early spring. She did see one, and we both had an encounter. That was very strange, but she has seen them since. And so I would say her last encounter was about a year ago. And she saw one standing in the light down the street kind of in the street lit area. And so that's where she saw that last experience, the last one she saw. Yeah, that's not that long ago. No, it's a little too soon, but yeah. There was another encounter you had where you saw a dogman that looked different than the two dogmen you had seen before. Please tell us about that experience. Well, I was about seven at that point, and we were close to moving. I didn't know that, but we were close to moving. I was seven, and I was in the woods with the two dogmen. I don't know if they were the... I know one was the same one that had followed me, but I don't know if the other one was the one that I had had in the previous encounter that was upset with it. But there was another one that looked different, and it was more... It looked humanoid. It kind of... It had knees like like a human, and feet almost shaped like a human, but toes that were longer and with nails. And it was up in a tree, and it was kind of hanging down. And I knew at that point that I was being taunted. I knew that at that point they were all three taunting me and letting me know, yeah, you know, I'm here. What can you do about it? And I'm like, why would you do that to a kid? But they did. I don't think they care, but it had a shorter muzzle, and it was red in color, and it had it actually had red eyes. The other two had amber eyes. This one actually had red eyes, and it had both arms up in the tree, and it was kind of dangling from limb to limb from these two limbs, and it was hanging downward. And it looked at me and smiled, and then it looked back up. And um, it had more teeth than the others more teeth and they were sharper but in a smaller muzzle. It was very scary. I don't know how to explain it except I saw a movie from the phase three I think it was. Not the movie I saw a picture from the movie and that's closer to what it looked like than anything else I've seen except it had red hair. It was lit in the sunlight so this happened during the daytime and while the others were on the ground and they were huge They were absolutely huge. This one was hanging from two limbs in the tree. And it had very little hair in front. They all did. They had very little hair in front, but a lot of hair in back. And where the others were dark in color, this one was actually red. And it had very short pointed ears. The others had kind of longer ears that were pointed. Did the dogmen that looked different than the other two interact with the other two in a way that led you to believe they got along, or did there seem to be a bit of tension between them? It seemed like it didn't belong with the other two, but it was there. It was like, as long as you're there to taunt this one, it's okay, you know? And I knew that it wasn't normally one that was probably welcome in their little pack, whatever it was, but... It was definitely there to taunt me, and they were letting it, and they were doing the same thing. They were all there to scare a little girl. Yeah, definitely it sounds like the dogman that you're describing for us right now was a type 3. Now's the perfect time to ask you this. Did you notice that all of its teeth in its mouth were sharp, or did some of the teeth seem to be blunt like our teeth would be? In the dogman that was red, that was more humanoid figure, its 
teeth were all sharp, very sharp. Um, the other dogmen, they had longer, sharper teeth towards the front and towards the very back and the middle. They were more like an actual canine's teeth would be, a little shorter, not as sharp as the front ones, but definitely like a canine would be. But that one had completely sharp teeth. I don't remember any of its teeth being normal looking. It just looked frightening. Okay, that's what I expected you to say. Now let's talk about the tips of its fingers and the tips of its toes. On the tips of its fingers and on the tips of its toes, did you notice claws or did you notice fingernails and toenails? The last one I saw that was red. At the end of the feet, there were long black claws that went into a point. There was nothing human about this thing. And on top, it had sharp claws. I think they all did. That's what I'd expect for you to say, and that's what I'd expect you to see. Before we move on, it's time for me to climb onto my soapbox, Valerie. Here's what I'm getting at. If I had a nickel for every time someone wanted to label a Type 3 as being a Type 3 Sasquatch, I'd be a rich man. But that's all wrong because they're not a type of Sasquatch. Their anatomical features bear that out. When you look at the anatomical features of a Sasquatch, it's obvious that they're a type of ape. They have fingernails and toenails the way apes do. They don't have a tail, so that means they cannot be a monkey. They must be a kind of ape. All right, let's talk about the teeth now. Every instance of an eyewitness seeing a Type 3, the eyewitness always states that all of the teeth in the Type 3's mouth were sharp. Apes don't have sharp post-canine teeth. The teeth that are directly behind the canine teeth are called post-canine teeth. Again, it's not the canine teeth. I'm talking about the teeth that are directly behind the canine teeth. Those, again, are called post-canine teeth. If a creature like a Type 3 has sharp post-canine teeth, that is a disqualifying anatomical feature for being a kind of ape. Therefore, it's a disqualifying anatomical feature for being a Sasquatch. What it is, I don't know, but I can tell you what it's not. Type 3s, obviously, are not a kind of Sasquatch for that reason. Furthermore, apes don't have claws. Apes have toenails and fingernails. They do not have claws on the tips of their fingers or on the tips of their toes. With Type 3s, they do always have claws on the tips of their fingers and on the tips of their toes. That, too, is a disqualifying anatomical feature for an ape. That's another reason why Type 3s are not and cannot be a kind of Sasquatch. What they are, I don't know, but I can tell you what they're not, and they are not a kind of Sasquatch. Their anatomical features, like I said, bear that out. Now, are they a canid? Because a lot of people, me included, refer to them as being Type 3 dogmen. They definitely are not a kind of canid. Dogman is just an appellation that a lot of people use to describe them. I don't know what they are. I can tell you what they're not. They're not a kind of Sasquatch, and they're not a type of canid. All right, now I can get off my soapbox and we can move on. You said you used to see one of those dogmen all the time. How often did you see him? And when you would see him, what would he do? He would trail along with me. He was in the wood line and I was on the road. And whenever I was on the road, when I didn't get a ride back up to my house, I'd get to a certain distinct area where I just dreaded going to that area of the road because I knew that it would be there and that if it wasn't, I needed to not think about it, not accept that it was there. I needed to just completely dissociate because if it felt me, I would feel it. And suddenly I'd have it trailing beside me and I'd look, you know, kind of a side glance real quick and I'd see it. And I see it's big haunches. That's why I called them kangaroo people. And that's all I could identify it with at the time was what I had seen at the zoo. And the actual bottom of the legs went down into the wood line on the incline. So it would trail along beside me. And when I would stop, it would stop. And everything was so silent. And when I would walk, I'd hear the rattling of everything being pushed down as it walked the grass, the dry grass, the limb, everything that was in that wood line would crunch as it walked with me. But when I stopped, it would stop. And it was like, I almost felt so toyed with because I couldn't walk and then hear it walk after me. It walked with me. 
and it stopped with me. And it was so upsetting. It was just like the worst kind of tease you can be through. But it was there every time that I had to walk up to the house. And if I had to walk down that one in particular, or at least it felt like that one, the feeling it gave me in my stomach, it felt like the same one. And I'd always see the amber eyes, and I would focus on not looking, on kicking the dirt, and if I needed to take a breather, because I had asthma really bad. And I'd start running up the street, and this thing would run with me, but it never actually... It only reached out and grabbed me that once by myself and then the other time with my friend. Other than that, it just walked with me along the wood line. And I was so terrified that it would actually jolt out of the wood line and, like, catch me before I got to my house. I was so afraid of that all the time because I knew it was there. It would have been bad enough if you did know what it was that was shadowing you in the woods like that, but unfortunately, since you did know what it was, that made it ten times worse. It made it a hundred times worse. It was really terrible to know that this thing that I couldn't identify that, you know, we weren't supposed to believe in. You know, I mean, around that time, Teen Wolf was the thing, and that Teenage Werewolf movie, the classic one, it was all silly, fuzzy boys turning into creatures that just didn't look anything like them. It it was horrifying looking. It it looked like a demon. It was so scary. And I couldn't identify it. It was it was a hundred times worse than you could ever imagine. It's just terrible. I mean, it's frightening to even think back and remember what it looked like. It scares me because I think these things can exist anywhere. Yeah, that is a really difficult fact to deal with. From what you told me about their behavior in our first conversation, at times it sounds like they tried to be as friendly towards you as a dog man could be. At other times it sounds like they were mean to you. Why do you think they would behave so differently towards you like that? I'm not sure why they wanted to taunt me. I think they're a very evil being, whatever they are. And I think that no matter what they're trying to do, it made me feel like they wanted me to be its friend, I guess, looking from a kid's standpoint, kind of like its friend, and I was knew that it was bad. And then to taunt me like they did, I think that's all it ever was, was just to scare a child, to scare somebody who didn't need to be scared, but they did anyway. And I just think they're a very ominous creature, very dark and very evil. I don't think that there's any good in them at all. Whether they made me feel like they wanted to befriend me or not, I felt like it was always a bad presence. There was never anything good about it. Ever. That sure is a cruel game they were playing with you. You said they tried to terrify you at times, but at any time did they ever give the impression that they were going to actually harm you? I would say when the third one showed up, the red one, that's when I felt like I was in absolute true harm's way. The other times I felt like I was in harm's way, but that time I felt like I was actually, they were showing me that they could kill me. There was just something about them and that setting in that day, I remember it very clearly. And it was like, I knew that they could kill me and I knew that they wouldn't hesitate. And I knew that I'd never see anybody again and nobody would ever know where I went. So it was very scary to me, and I guess that was the time that I absolutely knew for a fact that they could harm. But they never did, and so that's another thing. Why didn't they? And I think that's what it is a lot of times is a game. I think that maybe they can't harm people. I think that maybe they can't harm people, and or maybe they do, but they definitely tried to scare me and to make me believe that they could. And I know that they're capable of it. I know that in their pure mass and body form, they would be capable of killing a human being. If they really wanted to, they could. I don't know what holds them back. Well, unfortunately, they do hurt people from time to time. Not very often, but I've spoken with eyewitnesses who have been harmed by them before. So, it does happen. 
makes it even scarier to think about. Yeah. Yeah, they don't have any soft edges. You said the one that grabbed you seemed to want you there, but the other one didn't seem to want you there. Even though the one that grabbed you seemed to be somewhat subordinate to the other dog man, did he seem to be protecting you from the other one? It's what it seemed like, and it's actually what it felt like. I thought he was protecting me. I thought he was trying to get the other one to accept that I was there, and the other one so didn't want me there. And this one, the one that followed me most of the time up the wood line, it actually was swooping me towards the road. So I think that, I don't know, I always felt like I was allowed to go free. It felt like it was protecting me, but I knew it was very bad. I knew it was bad. And I knew it had no truly, truly good, at least in human nature, intention at all. But it did seem to protect me in some way. I don't understand it, but it did. Well, if he did, thank goodness for that. Yeah. Did the dog men stink, or were they not emanating much of a smell? Uh, from what I remember, I smelled a little something odd, like urine, but nothing that I can identify now, like as an adult. It's been so many years that I can't really remember, but I do remember smelling something of urine, and I knew that I was in its territory. So that's all I can remember. Was It did stink. I just don't remember in what ways it smelled. You know, I can't identify it really, except for the urine part. It smelled like the whole area around there was full of their urine. I remember there was a distinct smell while I was in that little laid down piece of grass in the woods. I remember there was a distinct smell there, but I don't remember anything other than that. I mean, the smell of urine and something else. But when I was up at the road, I never smelled anything that I could identify. It was more of a feeling and a knowledge. Well, that whole area, if they were bedding down there, it probably was loaded down with their urine. Would you say the way you were treated by the people you shared your experiences with or the actual experiences themselves were hardest to deal with? I would say both, actually. People can write you off as crazy all they want, but when you feel like you're alone and you've had experienced something so traumatic and frightening, I would say probably the experience then. If I had to choose between the two, the experience was the harder I don't know. Dealing with people also. It's good that my mom understood, but as a child, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know until I was an adult that she had experienced those things, too. And the experience itself was extremely traumatic. I remember it. I remember how I must have been absolutely horrified to have wet my pants because I never did that. But telling people as an adult what you seen and what you've experienced, that's extremely hard too because they don't believe it and they do want to push it off on something else that you're just allowing your mind to forget about and putting a monster in its place. But it's like, no, that monster was really there and it really happened. But you can't make another person acknowledge that unless they've seen it themselves. Just the experience itself was traumatic. The experiences were the hardest part of this to deal with, but it sounds like the way people reacted when you shared your experiences with them, that sounds like it must have been a close second. It was. It was really hard because I was trying to let them know of something that happened, but they wanted me to go back in my mind and remember something different, and I couldn't because that's exactly what happened. So trying to tell somebody, especially a therapist, oh my gosh, they'll just They'll label you as soon as they can as something incredibly insane and out there. And it's not. It's They haven't experienced it themselves. And these people, they don't know about. You don't know about it unless you've been there. So naturally, they want to pin it on something else that you've made your mind imagine was a monster. But, yeah, people dealing with it. From a psychological view and a therapist's view, it was not easy to talk about because I knew it had happened and I realized soon that there was no way I could talk to anybody about it without them labeling me as completely insane. 
Well, like I told you before, those people that responded the way they did when you told them about your experiences, they did so because of their own ignorance. See it for what it is, and that'll make it a lot easier to deal with. Exactly. And I hope they don't experience it. I don't want anybody else to experience this, but when you do experience it, there's not much else you can do but just keep going and know that nobody's going to understand it, really. And that's how I lived my life, just knowing nobody was going to understand what I had been through or what I had seen. And I felt alone until my mom told me about her experiences. But to hear your show, it actually brought everything back to life and it kind of confirmed it and gave me a confirmation and I was able to accept, okay, I'm not the only one who's been through this and I'm not the only child who went through this. So it's a lot easier to accept now than it's all actually just by myself knowing. Oh, I'm sure it is. Like I told you before, I'm so glad that you now realize that there are so many people out there who have gone through the same thing that you've gone through. Well, maybe not the same types of experiences where the dogmen grab them, but I'm glad you know that so many people have had encounters. That's really good. Right, exactly. It it is really, it's not good for them, but it's good to know that you're not alone and that there are other people who you can talk to who have been through the same exact types of monster scenarios that you knew were real. And I don't know, it's just, it's nice to know there's others. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm so glad you know that now. You have an anxiety disorder that you've been dealing with for some time. How sure are you that those experiences are why you have those issues with anxiety? I'm pretty sure because around that time that these things happened was about the time that I ended up with this fear of being separated and nobody ever knowing where I was going and nobody ever knowing where I had gone. And... Just the anxiety and the fear from then on seems to, seems to make sense. Just an unnatural fear of, of something taking you and nobody ever knows where you've gone. Nobody knows that you've died or that you're alive maybe still. And just this fear and this anxiety, it does go back to that point. So I don't doubt it started there because I remember it starting there. I don't remember it coming up later on in adulthood. I just remember it from that point on. It was an unnatural fear of something that I was told did not exist. Experiences like that would cause almost anyone to have anxiety issues, so yeah, that's not exactly a shocker. Right. In the past year, you've heard some strange howls. What more can you tell us about that? I don't understand them, but... I wasn't alone in hearing them. My mom actually heard them as well. Basically, I was at my computer. I was doing my thing. I was working on a picture and looking online. I was just doing different things. And suddenly I heard, like, these wolves howling. And it started beating up against the house and on top of the roof. And it eventually, I mean, I ended up on my floor crawling under my desk and listening to it just beating on top of the house and hitting up against the side of the house. And I don't know what happened. I don't know what it was doing, but it went from a normal wolf-like howl into, and I've only heard my dog do a similar kind of howl when she was extremely afraid of something and something was very wrong. And I've heard other neighborhood dogs howl. This is different. This is very loud. It was hitting the siding of the house and the roof. And it went into almost a man's voice screaming. And then into like, it almost sounded like it turned into a, like what you would imagine a banshee sounding like just a very high pitched scream from a howl into a man's scream into a high pitched woman's scream. And my mom came running in. And I was under my desk pretty much. And she was like, what on earth was that, you know? And I was like, I don't know. But it was around the time that she had seen the one down the street. So it doesn't surprise me that we heard it. I just don't know how many or how or what. I was inside the house. I didn't see any of it. I just heard it happen. 
and she did as well. Was it nighttime when that happened? Yes, it was about 11.30 to 11.40 p.m. that it actually happened. We heard it, and it lasted probably about five minutes. The pounding up against the house and the roof lasted about five minutes, and then the howl, and then it was over. (laughs) Complete silence. And the dogs, they did nothing. They just kind of, they were awake, and they didn't look comforted, but my mom came running in, and she had heard the same thing. What was that? And it lasted about five minutes, and it was between 11.30 and 11.40-ish. Wow, that's crazy. I wonder what that was all about. I honestly don't know, but it's scary to think about, and that she saw one during that time is also pretty freaky. It sure is. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Valerie. Before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Actually, I do. I wish people were more open-minded, but a lot of them aren't. So I'm going to say, when your children tell you there are monsters, take a little more acknowledgement and try to understand it more and delve into it more because it's not always in their minds. It's not always a cover-up for something. Sometimes it does actually happen, so listen to children more, because they know what they saw. That's pretty much it. Just listen more, people. Open your minds. I wish more parents did that. I do, too. It seems like a lot of people are too close and too into their adult lives to really pay attention to the children, and they'll just, you know, knock it off as something else when it's really something that should probably be looked into and definitely check out the area and make sure your child is safe when they acknowledge that something like this has happened. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, for coming on the show and telling us about those experiences, Valerie. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it, Vic. I really thought I was alone and I appreciate your show. Bring me to confirmation of it and acceptance. And I feel a lot better knowing that I'm not the only one. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you know you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. You too, Vic. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. If you've had a dog me an encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.